This video is an introduction to the atmosphere. And the word atmosphere comes from the Greek, atmos, which means vapor, and sphere, which means like a ball. So it's like a big ball of vapor. And sure enough, the atmosphere is like an ocean of air all around the ball that is the earth, all around us. You can see on the picture over there, sort of like an envelope of gases all around the earth. That ocean of air is held down by gravity. Gravity is the only thing keeping the atmosphere on Earth. If there wasn't for gravity, the atmosphere would fly off into space. The atmosphere is very different in its height, depending on where you are. Some places in the world, it can be over 16 miles, or other places it can be much shorter than that. It actually shrinks and expands depending on the heat of the place that you're in, like an accordion. So in the tropics, the atmosphere is much taller because it's hot. And in the polar areas, the atmosphere is actually much shorter. The atmosphere turns with the earth. So if you're ever wondering, is the air I breathe now going to end up in China in like 12 hours? The answer is no, it's not. It turns with the earth because the earth drags and has friction on the air. And most of the atmosphere, the vast majority, is to the very bottom. In the 44 miles or so at the bottom, we call this the troposphere, the lowest layer of all just because of gravity. We'll go through four major layers of the atmosphere, the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. Uh, some people also throw in the exosphere, an outer sphere, we'll leave that. But there's also a pause, meaning at the end of each of these spheres, there's a pause. There's a tropopause at the end of the troposphere, a, a stratopause at the end of the stratosphere, a mesopause and thermopause, etc. But we're just gonna look at the main spheres themselves. So at the bottom of all of it is the troposphere. The main thing to know about the troposphere is that's where all weather takes place. That's where all life takes place. That's where we live. The next layer up is the stratosphere. That's where there's no clouds, no turbulence. You're sort of beyond the weather. And at the very bottom of the stratosphere is where you find a special sublayer called the ozone layer, which we'll talk about in a second. The third layer up is the mesosphere, it literally means like middle sphere. And one of the things you can find there, you can see in the picture, are shooting stars, meteors going through there, which are basically like space rocks that are burning up on their way into the atmosphere. And then finally, at the top, you see the thermosphere, which is the thickest layer of the atmosphere. And just that and the exosphere tra trail off into space and just become uh, thinner and thinner as you go to the point where there's no specific line where the atmosphere ends. It's just the particles of air get so far apart that pretty soon there's just none left after a while. So you'd never be able to breathe in these upper layers. It's not even close to enough air up there. One of the phenomena you also see up in the thermosphere is called the northern lights. We'll look at that. And we can also look at the atmosphere as a whole. You see here, it's giving you proportions. And the very bottom is where we live. That red, red part at the very bottom is the troposphere. So you can see how short that is compared to the entire atmosphere all the way up to the exosphere, the purple layer at the very top. So even within the troposphere, we have you know Mount Everest, Mount McKinley, these really high mountains, and there's still a lot of air above that. And even that's super thin, even that's very difficult to breathe, even within the higher levels of the troposphere. Like we said, it's the incredible expanding troposphere, right? It goes up and down like an accordion depending on the seasons and also depending on where you are in the world. So what this is showing you is the North Pole is on the left and the equator is on the right. So it's like a sideways cutaway view of the troposphere. And it's showing you how we don't have to worry about these cells, but I'm showing you the height of the troposphere. It's much shorter around the North Pole because it's just so cold. The air doesn't have the energy to expand up. By contrast, around the equator, the air is very hot, so it's got lots of energy to expand. We're going to learn that for air or any gases, heat is motion. So you put heat on a gas, it gets hotter, automatically moves more, expands. Up there in the northern lights, uh, up in the thermosphere, we get these incredible uh, displays at night in the far northern regions of the world. What is that exactly? Well, this is basically uh, particles that are charged from space that are uh, attracted to the Earth's magnetic poles. Okay, so Earth has a 
magnetic north and a magnetic south, which is a little bit off, uh, a little distance away from the actual north and south poles, the geographic north poles. And charged particles from space are attracted to those magnetic north and south poles. And as they're drawn to the north and south magnetic poles, these charged particles are streaking through the upper atmosphere, the thermosphere, way out there. And so if we look up and we're in Sweden or Alaska or uh, you know Canada, something like that, you can see these particles basically entering the Earth's atmosphere into the thermosphere and giving off uh, energy as their charged particles um, hit the thermosphere. So they're streaking across the thermosphere on their way to the magnetic poles. And those are real pictures. It actually looks like this. The charge gives off, gives this glow along the way. And that's known as the Northern Lights or Aurora Borealis. Below the thermosphere in the mesosphere, what happens there? Well, we have meteors, which again are space rocks like you see there that are entering the Earth's atmosphere. But that mesosphere is so hot that it burns the rocks on the way in typically. Once in a while, a space rock will make it through all the way to the Earth, but typically they burn up up there. If you go back for a second, you can see in our diagram that the temperature is this red line on the left, on the right, and the hotter temperature is to the right and the colder to the left. So the mesosphere is odd because it starts out at the bottom of the mesosphere. It's super hot. Top is super cold. So these meteors, they burn up typically towards the bottom of the mesosphere where it's really hot. And that's also why space shuttles have to be, you know, especially insulated to be able to survive those temperatures. Said at the bottom of the stratosphere is a special sublayer called the ozone layer, O3 gas. So oxygen is O2, and this is O3. So ozone gas is both necessary and good for humans and also bad for humans. It's good for humans when it's up there in the ozone layer. It's kind of a natural sunblock. It blocks 98% of the ultraviolet rays, the UV rays that are coming in. Those are the same rays that give us a suntan. So that's good. Otherwise, everyone would fry if we didn't have the ozone layer. But at the same time, when ozone gets in our atmosphere that we breathe in the troposphere below, that's bad. Okay, so it's bad for us to breathe it, but we need it up there in the lower stratosphere to help us block the sun's UV rays. There's a problem, however. The ozone layer has holes in it. These holes that you see, the green is the ozone. It's supposed to cover the whole globe, but you can see there's a giant hole on the right and there's some holes on the left here. Uh, on the left is 1979 and it grew by 2009. And the reason for that is usually attributed to the use of CFCs, which are a chemical that's used in often aerosol sprays like hairspray back in the 1980s um, and other products that when you spray it, it goes up into the atmosphere and then it blows up there towards the polar regions. And these CFCs were banned by the Montreal Protocol and International Agreement in 1989. It's actually one of the most successful examples of environmental cooperation in the world because pretty much every country was on board with it. They did it and it worked because now this picture on the right is in 2009, but now the indications are that the ozone layer is beginning to heal and close back up again. So that's good, as long as we keep going in that direction. So now that we've talked about some of the layers of the atmosphere, we can talk about weather and climate, what goes on down in the troposphere where we live. Weather and climate are, in one hand, they're the same, in the sense that they're both describing the conditions of the atmosphere, this envelope of gases that we see all around us. But on the other hand, they're different because weather is short term and it's local, it's in a particular place. Whereas climate is long term, okay, it has to be over decades in order to be uh, a climate change to actually say that the climate has changed. Some. So it's a long term average weather in a region, this climate. So for example, on the right, you can see two maps and the top is a weather map and you know it's a weather map because it's dynamic. It's changing moment to moment, minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. Climate maps don't do that. On the bottom is a climate map. Those might change every 10 years or something like that. They have to 
verify that these weather changes have been long-term and sustained, not just sort of a blip on the radar. So weather short-term and local, climate is over a larger region and it's long-term. The ingredients of weather and climate are four things, moisture, wind, temperature, and pressure. So those are like four ingredients in the stew that is climate and weather. And you can think what would happen if you changed each one or you combined certain changes in each one. So if you have, for example, a hurricane up top, you have high moisture, obviously, because those are all clouds spinning there, but you also have to have high winds and you also have to have high temperatures outside. The top of the ocean down to, I think, 20 meters has to be 80 degrees or above to sustain that hurricane above. And so you put these different uh, combinations together and you get different types of weather. If you're in the next layer above the troposphere, the stratosphere, then you are literally flying above the weather, right? So if you look out the plane, sometimes you can see below you, there's, there's clouds down there and you're literally flying up above the weather. In the atmosphere, there are many gases, but by far the most abundant one is nitrogen, which makes up 78% of the atmosphere. And then in second place is oxygen, which we breathe. So it's kind of remarkable because if you take 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen, that's 99% of the atmosphere's gases right there. So the only other gases out there all fit into the last 1%. Okay, so that includes all those climate change gases right, like carbon dioxide and methane, and all these other things that are in the, in the air, they're all in the 1% left over. But that doesn't mean they're not important. So many elements like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, all move around through ecosystems, right, through the world, including through the atmosphere in these cycles, right? They move through us, we eat them, we uh, drink them, they go into uh, animals and plants and trees and the atmosphere itself and the dirt and all of that movement are called cycles, biogeochemical cycles, okay? biogeochemical cycles, bio because they're living things and geo because it's the earth itself as well. And then there are chemicals moving around. So all of that uh, movement of those things like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycling through the air, through cows, through dirt, through trees, through human beings, through factories and fossil fuels, all the way into the bedrock underneath, et cetera, et cetera, and the water. Okay, so there's many biogeochemical cycles and the atmosphere is a key element of that, a key part of that cycle. So nitrogen is essential for living things and especially for plants. It's a fertilizer basically for plants. But for plants to be able to use it, you have to fix that nitrogen in the soil. So there's lots of nitrogen in the atmosphere. Remember we said it's the number one gas, but it doesn't just float its way into the soil. It has to be fixed. So you see down here where it says nitrogen fixing bacteria living in legume root nodules. So legume plants like beans and things are have these bacteria that live on their roots that are very good at um, fixing nitrogen, which means to sort of uh, grab it and put it in a state that plants can actually use it. Okay, so see down here, there's also some in the soil as well. So um, that fixes the nitrogen from air, from the atmosphere into soil, and then from soil into plants. So it goes between three different components there, the air to the soil to the plants in this cycle. That's one example of a part of a biogeochemical cycle, the nitrogen cycle. And that process in general is called nitrogen fixing. Just in general, the gases in the atmosphere that are used most are oxygen and carbon dioxide. Obviously we breathe oxygen and we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. And in a great relationship, plants use carbon dioxide, the stuff that we breathe out and plants give off oxygen, the stuff that we breathe in. And so we have a great relationship with plants. That's why when you run through a place with a lot of trees, it's more refreshing because they're giving off oxygen, the same thing that you need. It's also when you run by the ocean, you get the same sort of fresh air. And it's because the ocean has plankton on top, has plant plankton, which just like any other plants, give off oxygen. So oxygen is coming up off of that ocean 
from the plankton on top, the green stuff. The sun's insulation, which is the, all the energy coming from the sun, not just light and heat, but all the rays from the sun, infrared, etc. All of that warms up the atmosphere and drives all of the weather and climate systems, which we'll be looking at. And again, the name of the total package of all the radiation from the sun is insolation, which is a word comprised of three other words, incoming solar radiation, insolation. Sun's insolation is the sort of the starter of all of the weather and climate. It's got all the energy that drives all of that. It's something called the greenhouse effect, which is sort of the um, main mechanism in climate change, but it's just something that we need uh, for life. And it's gone overboard with climate change. The greenhouse effect is simply uh, the way that the planet naturally warms by trapping heat using gases called greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, like methane, um, even water vapor in the clouds traps heat. So simply put, um, energy comes in from the sun and it hits the earth and some of that energy re-radiates back out of the uh, earth and a reflex and uh, a lot of it will be escaping off into space like this yellow arrow here, but some of it will hit the atmosphere, greenhouse gases, and it will then reflect back down and bounce back down again. Okay. And so that's called the greenhouse effect, that trapping of heat that otherwise would go off into space. Now that's a natural thing. The greenhouse effect is not anything bad in itself, but not only that, it's actually critical because if it wasn't for the greenhouse effect, we'd all freeze, right? The earth would be way too cold. So we need the greenhouse effect and uh, we're lucky it's there. The type of energy that is captured and um, trapped by greenhouse effect is called infrared radiation, infrared. So you remember the uh, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, uh, green, blue, indigo, violet, the colors of the rainbow. Well, right before red on the spectrum is infrared because infra means before okay in Latin. so infrared right before red and infrared energy is also given off by fire you know it's like the glow of fire as well so it's uh, very common that's the kind of energy trapped by greenhouse gases it heats up the world so why is it called a greenhouse effect why is it called the greenhouse effect it's because it acts like a greenhouse, meaning the gases that trap heat that we saw, you can see the glow of gases here in the picture. It's kind of whitish glow there. Those are the greenhouse gases and the ones that are sort of acting like a greenhouse and trapping the heat. So how does that like a greenhouse? What's like that? Well, a greenhouse is actually not necessarily green on the outside. It's green on the inside because you put plants in there. That's what it's for, it's to keep the plants able to grow even if it gets cooler outside. So the way it works is it's a, it's a house with transparent windows all around. And when the light comes in from the sun, as we know, light can pass through a window, but then when that light energy hits the floor, the plants, the inside of the, the greenhouse, then something happens, right? Just like it, if it hits your arm, you're gonna have light hit your arm, but then your arm eventually it will get warmer, right? What's happening there? That's a change of light to heat, okay? Light changes over into heat when it hits you, it builds up. You can do that with a flashlight too, right? You can shine a flashlight on your arm and you get a little bit warmer there. So that's what happened. The light comes in through the window, hits the plants, hits the table, everything, turns to heat. But now you got this heat radiating through here. The air is getting hotter in there, building up but heat can't travel back out a window, right? Like light can, Like The windows are transparent to light, but they're not transparent to air, right? Because the heat is now in the air. So that means it's a one-way trip, right? Like this blue arrow right here, the light energy comes in, but the heat energy doesn't go out, okay? And so it builds up inside. And that allows it to actually be hotter inside the greenhouse than it is outside just because of that one-way trip of the energy in that doesn't get out. But we've all had greenhouses in our own lives, typically. So if you have a, a car, basically, it's like a greenhouse. You know, in the car in the summertime, when you get back to your car and 
you open the door and you hit in the face because it's like super hot air coming out of that car. That's basically the same thing. It's what's happened is the inside of your car has become hotter than the outside. Even if it was hot outside, it's hotter in the car. And what's happened is your car windows act like a greenhouse, right? The light from the sun has been coming through your windshield or your windows on the side, and it's been heating up the air and the seats and the dashboard and the steering wheel inside. And they've been radiating heat through the air in there, which has been building up. But that heat can't come out because the windows are there, right? It can't go through the window. The light can come in, but it can't go out. And so just like a greenhouse, the heat is trapped inside your car and you gotta wait a second for that heat to get out, right? Before you get in the car. So it's the same thing that's happening right here. Okay, these, these gases are the greenhouse gases. They act like your windshield, your windows in your car. Light can come in through them, but once they transfer into heat, these are like the seats of your car, the earth, hit that, the seats get hot, then that radiates into the air, the air gets hot, and then it can't get back out again because these greenhouse gases are there trapping it, okay, like the windows on your car. And there's a word for the reflectivity of the Earth's surface when insulation comes and finally does hit the Earth, how much of that just bounces off and how much of that sticks sort of and is absorbed into the Earth itself. And the word for that is called albedo. And there's a word for that, the reflectivity of the Earth's surface, how much of that insulation ends up bouncing off and how much ends up absorbing into the Earth. And that word is albedo. Okay, albedo is the reflectivity of Earth's surface. So you can see these different landscapes. You can just think which one of these is going to absorb more energy and which one is going to reflect more energy. Right? On the left, you can see the desert. It's got no vegetation. There's nothing to sort of like a sponge to grab hold on to that uh, energy coming in because you know that plants use light from the sun, right? That light energy for photosynthesis, right? But if there's no plants or very few plants, then that light's not being absorbed, right? So that's not going to keep it on the earth. And also it's a lighter color. It's a pale beige sand here. And you know that lighter colors tend to reflect more. So it's a lighter color sand, it's no vegetation to have absorption of that light. It's going to have a higher albedo, 20 to 35 percent reflection. The savanna, which is like tall grasslands, like in Africa, for example, uh, that's going to have sort of a medium albedo because that vegetation that's there will absorb uh, light for photosynthesis. Um, but at the same time, it's not that thick, you know, so some of it will bounce back. But on the right, you have a very, very lush rainforest. And so there's so much photosynthesis going on there, all these huge leaves are competing for sunlight, that they're sucking the uh, light energy right out of the atmosphere, and that is creating a very low albedo, okay? So much less of the sun's energy, the insulation, is reflected in a rainforest than, say, a desert. And where is it going? It's going into those plants. It also may go into water, too, to evaporate water as well, heat of evaporation. We see albedos often in urban environments. It's a big issue. The, uh, trying to keep the heat down in cities because the cities tend to have machines and cars that are creating more heat. And also cities tend to have streets that are dark and therefore have a low albedo, meaning they don't reflect very much. And that tends to make the city too hot. Okay, so asphalt you see here has one of the lowest albedos of all. The albedo is measured on a scale from zero to one. Okay, so zero would be a total absorption of the energy and one would be maximum reflectivity, right? It just bounces right off like a mirror almost. So you can see some of the really high albedo things would be like straight white paint up here, whereas some of the low albedo things are like charcoal and asphalt and things like that. So um, we have the urban heat island effect is the tendency for cities to get too hot. And some people say that in order to counter that and cool cities down, and to counter climate change. Uh, if you, this is a theory, if you turned all the streets in 200 major cities in the world from darker colors into white or to reflective colors, then that would actually counteract uh, climate change if you do enough cities, if you do all those streets. There's actually major efforts to uh, uh, if you look online to paint roofs, there's groups that go out and they paint roofs of these, these highly reflective white paint to, um, instead of a dark, typical tar roof, 
and uh, makes them very, very reflective. So the cities lose heat that way. So in the big picture, the insulation from the sun comes in and heats up the world, but unevenly. We know that the sun's direct rays hit mostly in the tropics between tropical circles, 23.5 north and south. And so that creates this tropical zone, which is warmer. And then the middle latitudes tend to be more moderate temperatures. And then the polar areas tend to be colder. The very basic three climate regions. We're gonna look in the next uh, couple presentations at a much more detailed breakdown of why certain climates are where they are. But that's the basic uh, three climate zones. Sometimes they call this the torrid zone or the tropical zone, the temperate or moderate, and then the polar zones are the basic three in the world. Now the heat from the tropics can then move due to the winds and to the ocean currents. The winds and the ocean currents are like nature's great movers of heat and transfers of heat. And that's what we'll see coming up. So that's a look at the atmosphere, the four major layers, the biogeochemical cycles, the effects of insulation, how they vary depending on the albedo and the latitude, and also a little bit about the greenhouse effect. We're gonna go into more detail on global wind systems and climate in the next couple of presentations.